All right, great. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for, for registering and taking the time today um, at the beginning of the holiday season to um, talk with us about fall pest prevention. This is a program from Our Water, Our World and is uh, brought to you by the Solano Stormwater Alliance. And this is an alliance of organizations, uh, the city of Sassoon City, the city of Fairfield, Vallejo Flood and Water, Flood and Wastewater District and the City of Vallejo and the Fairfield Sassoon Sewer District, um, who all work together to uh, keep the water flowing to the San Francisco Bay from Solano County clean. So my name is Emily Corwin. I'm a senior environmental engineer and our um, speaker today, um, a returning speaker is Suzanne Von Tempo. We're uh, just uh, very lucky to have her as with us, um, sharing her knowledge. Um, she's a program manager for Our Water, Our World. She works as an environmental educator. She teaches these foundational principles that we're going to be talking about today about integrated pest management, um, eco-friendly pest management around the home and garden. And she's worked as a professional gardener for over 20 years. So uh, with that, Suzanne, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Emily. Oh. I should add, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat um, and we'll probably save them to the end. But if there are any that um, we think Suzanne can answer in the moment, we'll try and um, pop them in. So great, thanks Suzanne. Yeah, as well as any questions, uh, well, you know, pest, uh, that I'm not addressing on the program in the outline, go ahead and put them in the chat also. Thank you so much, Emily. All right. Um, Oh, sorry. Let me just get organized. Okay. So yes, we are going to go through slides. I'd say for, I'm, I'm shooting for 50 minutes, but I think it's going to be very close to an hour, but I do want to leave some time for your questions. Um, what we're going to go through is I'm going to provide an introduction to the Our Water, Our World program, and we're going to look at integrated pest management and the controls, the action steps that we use. And that's going to be the first half, but it might be a little shorter than the first half, maybe the first 20 minutes. Um, and then I'm going to uh, really talk about what uh, managing uh, these fall pests, because these are the common ones I'm getting asked about on a regular basis, but I'm sure there might be some other pests that you'd like to hear about. So please go ahead and add those into the chat. So the Our Water, Our World program, it is a now a statewide program that partners with water pollution prevention agencies, uh, such as the Solano Stormwater Alliance and retailers that sell pesticides. And we provide integrated pest management education to both the associates and the consumers, the public, to help um, folks identify uh, what their pest problems are and solutions that will be less toxic, not a water, not polluting the waterways, and that will have sustainable results. And you might recognize our materials by those little um, uh, shelf tags that we identify eco-friendly products with at the retail outlets, as well as fact sheets. We have these racks that have uh, a library of fact sheets that you can reference, and you can always go to the ourwaterourworld.org website to learn more. And what I wanted to share is that um, uh, runoff from our properties uh, any time we have rain or we're power washing the house or washing the car, that water runs off our landscapes, any of that water that isn't absorbed into the soil and will enter our storm drain or a, if we happen to live near a creek um, that our property borders on, it will also enter that creek. Uh, but then it's going to flow directly to a local waterway without going through any type of filtration process. Uh, that water, as it's moving into the storm drain or uh, another local water, way can bring with it any uh, synthetic pesticides or synthetic uh, fertilizers, pet waste, litter, debris, oils, solvents, and so forth, anything that we're using around our property, bringing it with us. So uh, one uh, aspect, or I guess the main aspect of the Our Water World program is to help uh, reduce those pollutants around the house, uh, around our properties that can get into the waterways. And then inside the house, I just wanted to share that, um, uh, oh wait, sorry, oh my gosh. 
something just happened, uh, that when we're using pesticides inside the house, um, it is very easy for them to get into the into down the drain through the sewer system and um, to the wastewater treatment facility, where at the wastewater uh, treatment facility, they are not removed. Uh, many of them are not removed before getting discharged. So that's um, something that many of us are not aware of when we're using like a, uh, an ant spray. We see those ants coming in the kitchen. We're using a spray a week later. We've totally forgotten that we've used a pesticide. It's invisible. We're mopping up that floor or wiping off that countertop. That pesticide is on the mop or the sponge and it's getting um, wrung out through the sink. So it's really uh, one of those things just to keep in mind. Let's always try to focus on um, bringing in eco-friendly products within the home so that we um, don't have to, you know, be as, uh, well, it just would be easier not to pollute um, the water that way. Okay, so we're going to look at integrated pest management. And integrated pest management, as um, many of you know, is a science-based approach to uh, managing pest problems. It helps us look at the system as a whole. And when we see something isn't exactly right, we take a closer look, we get curious, and we want to monitor uh, something's chewing leaves on my plum tree. I want to just take a closer look and see, is that problem um, getting worse? And then I identifying, um, you know, by an evaluation process, what that uh, threshold of tolerance is, how much damage can I um, tolerate versus how much damage the plant uh, can um, tolerate or the environment. And that's usually the situation here is oftentimes we have um, the plant can definitely handle uh, more uh, have a higher tolerance than we do. But with that, we want to look at how we can prevent this problem from happening. Uh, we want to take some action to reduce those pest problems. And then we want to monitor and uh, evaluate if our actions actually have worked, if we need to uh, start the process again, and then how we can prevent that problem from happening again. The action steps and steps in integrated pest management are called controls. So con cultural controls are going to be bolstering the health of the environment, be it the garden or the home. Uh, mechanical controls or physical controls are the tools we use to manage the pest problem. Biological controls are uh, working with a living organism, such as beneficial insects, to manage the pest problems and support the ecosystem. Um, chemical controls, which are the pesticides, we're always going to use as a last resort after we've exercised all of the other controls. And when we get to biological controls, um, or at least towards the end of the program, remind me of a really funny story I have about that, because you like to think that biological controls are primarily for outside the home, but there are um, situations when we can use them inside the home. So I'm going to go through these IPAM controls and then we're going to dive into the pest problems. So uh, cultural controls. This is growing a healthy garden to manage pests naturally. So many of us know the benefits of adding, uh, building healthy soil by adding compost, uh, but specifically when it's related to pest management, when we add compost, we're reducing the need for pesticides because we're actually increasing the health of the plant, the overall health of the plant. And the uh, microbiology in the compost is actually um, going to fight pathogens and bad, bad bacteria in the soil that also can cause problems. I'd like to also share that earthworm castings will also play a role in this. Um, they actually have enzymes that will help uh, prevent pest and um, and diseases. Uh, of course, feeding with organic fertilizers are going to reduce uh, pests uh, because uh, the main reason is, is that we're feeding the planet at a more natural rate. We're preventing a lot of uh, growth stimulation, unnatural growth stimulation, or those growth spurts that we see when we're using synthetic fertilizers. Um, when we are feeding, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 
when we feed with synthetic fertilizers, we're actually stimulating a lot of new growth and insect, insect pests are, are not um, ding-dongs. They actually see that new growth and they know that they can get their mouth parts through that leaf tissue with a lot of ease and access all those sugary juices. So when we're feeding with organics, we're reducing that. Of course, protecting the soil with mulch is going to not only reduce, reduce uh, weed seeds from germinating, but it's also gonna protect the overall health of the root zone. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about planting the right plant in the right place in a moment, but that is crucial. Uh, it's also important for those of us that grow food crops, annual food crops, we wanna rotate those crops to uh, reduce any pests that might overwinter in the soils like to feed on those particular food crops. We're going to provide healthy irrigation or healthy watering practices, which means watering, um, growing healthy root zones by watering deeply and less often as that plant becomes established. And once that plant is set, established, and then we're going to provide healthy uh, garden maintenance. So plant selection is going to reduce pest problems. Uh, because we're going to always plant the right plant in the right place. We want to do our homework. We're going to read these tags. We're going to do a little bit of online research or reference some of our books that we have in our library to make sure we are matching the plant, any plant we're bringing into the garden, to the conditions of the garden. Um, we want to make sure we're going to understand the growing habit of this plant and make sure we're matching the mature size to the space that's available. This is really important uh, and it's a common mistake. And when we're, plant, we're, when we're adding a plant that uh, overgrows its area, we'll have a tendency to do a lot of pruning. And a lot of pruning, not only does it stress out the plant, uh, it's gonna stimulate a lot of new growth. And as I just shared, all that new growth is what attracts a lot of pest problems. Um, we're going to uh, avoid any overcrowding. We really want nice air circulation because uh, pests like white flies and spider mites really like to be in crowded areas of plants where that um, it's very humid and protected. And we're going to group plants together. When we bring new plants into the garden, we're going to add them to areas that they share the similar um, needs, similar watering needs, similar sun exposure needs and so forth. Um, once those plants, once that plant is established so that it can actually uh, blend into that um, garden area, that garden zone with ease and share all the same uh, um, environmental uh, needs that plant um, of all the other plants in that garden. I apologize, I feel like I'm stumbling over that one. We're going to plant correctly. And what I mean by that is we're going to, the illustration that's just to the left, uh, the, we wanna always make sure the plant is planted ever so slightly above the grade of the soil. And I'm just talking like maybe a fraction of an inch. Uh, understand when we're adding, amending that soil, adding compost, we're adding a lot of air and plants have a tendency to settle, that root ball will settle slightly. Well, when we do add uh, mulch around that drip line, if the plant is too deep, then uh, the water will lift that mulch. It will uh, float in and it'll settle around that crown. We always wanna make sure that the crown of the plant is uh, open, is exposed, that there's air circulation at the crown. We always wanna feel that mat of roots right at the top of the soil. And then we're going to um, grow deep, healthy root zones with water. So as we become established, we're going to be watering deeply and less often. And then we're going to provide healthy garden maintenance. And what that looks like is going around and cleaning up any food crops that are from the summer. Um, I myself even still have one more tomato plant that I kind of overlooked that I need to clean up. Um, but uh, any apples that are out there, any uh, fruit, any nuts, anything that's out there that can attract pests. Uh, this time of the year, it would be specifically rats, mice, uh, raccoons, uh, possums, skunks, and so forth. So we want to just make sure everything's cleaned up. And especially if it's apples, uh, we want to make sure we're not harboring any coddling moths uh, because we want to prevent that coddling moth uh, outbreak that happens in the spring. Uh, any leaves that might have diseases on them, 
uh, from our roses or from any other plants, we want to remove them, get them in that green waste bin. Do not put them in our home compost systems. We want to get them off site. And as we're cleaning up the garden, it really helps us see where there's pest problems as well as any irrigation malfunctions. And then what, uh, as we move, we're moving into a winter season when there's hopefully going to be a few more uh, rain events and maybe a, a storm or two, we want to uh, identify if there are any um, uh, limbs on trees that might fall. Uh, maybe they're compromised. They might fall and damage a structure like a fence line or a shed or a roof line. We want to manage those. Um, but pretty much we want to wait and keep all of our pruning until uh, the deciduous trees and uh, shrubs, maybe in that January, February time before bud break and then um, spring for many of our other plants. But really always mindfully pruning, making sure we're checking for any chrysalis or bird nest, things like that, uh, so that we're not... Um, you know, damaging any of the precious wildlife that we might have in the ecosystem of our gardens. And then some of us are might be familiar with these campaigns that we're hearing about a lot this year, leave the leaves, um, leaves that are falling off the trees, especially the deciduous trees. Well, that's the mother's nature's mulch. And those trees um, are doing us a service. They're dropping their leaves. Those leaves are going to protect those root zones over the winter months, but also provide um, habitat and um, nesting areas areas for a lot of our beneficial insects, um, as well as providing food for our birds. A lot of our birds are scratching around looking for any of those insects they might enjoy. But then um, when it comes to um, doing any additional pruning, I'd just like to invite you to consider leaving some of these things. Uh, so this aster right here, which is in bloom right now, it's my late bloomer, which I love because it uh, supports pollinators that might be out on a warm day. But the seeds provide a lot of food for a lot of the little songbirds. So I will really not deadhead it or clean it up until uh, pretty late winter, early spring when it's just starting to push again. And then like Japanese anemones, um, we'll see them now. I really encourage everyone, if you're growing this plant to leave those little tufts for the birds, they use it as nesting material. And then of course, any berries that we have on our properties to leave them as well, because they provide a uh, high nutrition for a lot of the songbirds that are also visiting our gardens. Okay, so mechanical controls or the physical controls, these are the tools. And there are, I would say, well, this is also a very big uh, category. I'm always looking at how we can prevent pest problems by using these tools. And that is going to look like weather stripping and door sweeps. Uh, these are going to prevent crawling insects from coming in, but also keep the heat inside the house, which is a benefit. Uh, a fresh bead of caulk to seal up cracks and crevices is also going to keep crawling insects and flying insects out. Of course, when we have rodents coming in the house, that's no good. That is a problem. So we want to seal up those points of entry uh, and secure um, our home with quarter inch hardware cloth which is galvanized wire fencing. Uh, we use quarter inch because uh, mice and young rats can fit through three eighths of an inch, which is the diameter of a pencil. So um, that's why we work with quarter inch hardware cloth and we put that behind foundation vents and, um, and attic vents and so forth. Or taking advantage of um, little sheet metal corners. These are to hold up gutters around the roof line, but I find they're very inexpensive and very uh, effective at keeping rodents out from chewing the edges of the garage door. That, um, that bumper that's at the bottom of the garage door, they, uh, it's very common that they chew through it and we put this there, they will avoid that. Of course, working at traps, and there's so many different types of traps that we'll look at, and then uh, using barriers such as row cover. But other barriers could look like netting, be it uh, netting, like bird netting or insect netting, uh, deer fencing or deer netting. Um, these are all really great tools that we can use around the garden. 
Um, we can look at gopher baskets to prevent gophers from eating root zones or lining those raised beds with the uh, gopher wire or half inch hardware cloth. And then using um, copper tape as a barrier to prevent slugs and snails. And then uh, tools like scare tape, though it's not a barrier, it is a very effective deterrent to keep uh, birds off your fruit trees. Sheet mulching is another wonderful barrier to prevent and reduce weed seeds from germinating, but then also to regenerate the soil, especially if you've got an area of the garden that's kind of crummy, it's really effective to uh, regenerate the soil in that area. Or uh, if you've got an area of weeds and it's always really overwhelming, just go ahead and take advantage of this practice of laying down layers of cardboard and no less than three inches of chips on top. You don't even have to mow the weeds, just, just push them down with your feet and then put this on top. When we're looking at exclusion or preventing um, pests, we wanna make sure we're using the right uh, tool for the right pest. So since so much of outdoor pest management through my eyes is with ex prevention and exclusion, we're going to look at how we can prevent rats and mice from chewing our food crops or getting into our raised beds and food gardens with quarter inch hardware cloth. Uh, gophers, of course, will be half inch hardware cloth or gopher wire. Squirrels um, and other critters, which we'll look at in a bit, three quarter inch fencing or poultry wire or similar will be perfect to prevent them from digging, okay, or prevent them from getting into containers. Um, and deer fencing, of course, it's going to be seven feet or taller. Working with traps, as I mentioned, this, there's a huge category and traps can look a lot of different ways as gopher uh, and mold traps, rodent traps, uh, fly traps, yellow jacket traps. We've got sticky traps that we can use as indicators, but also to uh, um, reduce pest populations and snail traps. That's a snail board. Um, this is on the UCIPM website. So it's literally fence boards and um, with these runners underneath and you put it down next to an area where there's a lot of snail and slug activity. They don't like the sunshine. So they'll go under the snail board for the shade, the cool, moist condition environment. Then we can lift up that board and then we can just scrape those snails off into this soapy bucket of water or feed them to the chickens. Very effective, kind of gross. And then inside the house, uh, we use, um, there's a lot of different types of generic insect uh, sticky traps, but these are really uh, going to help not only reduce the pest problems, but to help us identify where the problem is really centralized and where to focus our actions which I will uh, talk about a little bit in a moment. And then the biological controls. Of course, these are uh, inviting living organisms to come in, uh, into the garden, planting plants that will attract them. We want to attract pollinators to help increase our yields and also uh, make the environment really uh, um, inviting for not only our beneficial insects or pollinators, but also for the birds. They pay us an amazing service by reducing a lot of pest problems and other garden allies like our Western fence lizard and so forth. And the way we attract is by planting a, a variety of flowering plants. We wanna grow biodiversity. Um, and let me share, when we plant them, they will come. So looking at plants that either look like a daisy or a sunflower, such as the aster here, the uh, gallardia, um, the uh, cosmos, the erigeron in this picture, though that might, this might look like a single flower, it's actually, the petals are raised around the flowers. So the cone in the middle is going to be all the little flowers. Uh, or we can also plant things that come in clusters of tiny flowers, such as yarrow, ceanothus, sweet alyssum, um, and so forth. And the reason why we want to plant a variety of flowering plants throughout the year that uh, also have little flowers is because so many of our beneficial insects um, are tiny and we have a, a large category of pollinators that are micro pollinators. They're very, very tiny. We don't even recognize them with uh, as actual uh, beneficial pollinators because they're so tiny. So yes, plant them and this, they will come. 
And now I want to talk uh, at length about chemical controls um, because this is one of my big passions is to help folks have a better understanding of the pesticides that they use, including eco-friendly pesticides. And something I like to share is that pest pesticides don't always solve the pest problem. They're just killing the pest. So understand that some pests are seasonal um, they are um, important and they are to be expected. And the reason why I say some pests are important is because they are providing food for the beneficials, which helps keep a healthy balance. So if you want beneficial insects in your garden, um, a big component is not just planting all those beautiful flowers, uh, but having some pests. So I actually look forward to seeing aphids on my roses because then I look forward to seeing the serpent fly larva that is going to eat those aphids. Um, and then an infestation of a pest can actually be a clue that something is not working, that maybe that plant is stressed or something else is going on. So if I've got ants marching up my plum tree, that's gonna give, that's an indicator that there's another pest uh, at hand, maybe aphids or scale insects, or if there's a, an excessive amount of plants, on, uh, of pests on a plant, uh, maybe aphids on my kale, I can look at the, the kale and understand why that's happening. A few plant, a few pests on my kale, a few aphids on my kale will be okay. I'm just gonna wipe them off with my hands. So when we use pesticides, we're always gonna use them as a last resort. As I mentioned, we're always gonna choose less toxic and eco-friendly products like our neem, our horticultural oil, our insecticidal soaps and so forth. We're going to apply these products according to the label. We're always going to wear protective clothing and we're going to understand the risks. So eco-friendly, um, since I started this work, I can share that there are so many eco-friendlies now widely available uh, through different retailers, uh, our garden centers, our um, box stores, our hardware stores and so forth. Uh, we see a very large variety. Um, we can buy eco-friendly just about anywhere. It looks like insecticidal soaps, uh, botanical pesticides, those that come from uh, plants, uh, biopesticides, which come from beneficial bacteria, oils, uh, neem, and um, different uh, eco-friendly fungicides such as the co uh, copper soap. And when we're looking to manage pests problems. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of things that it, we really want to understand uh, how the pest that we want to manage is operating. And what I mean by is how they're doing the damage is often through the different types of mouth parts that they have. Uh, so for insects that have sucking or rasping mouth parts, um, sucking mouth parts would be something like an aphid that has like a straw and they actually stick their straw-like mouth into uh, the, the cells, the juices of that leaf. And that's how they're accessing those sugary juices. Uh, rasping mouth parts that might be like a spider mite or thrips where they're actually um, going to uh, feed on that plant those juices by rasping into the leaf. Well, with these types of insects, we can simply wipe them off. We can uh, syringe them off with a spray bottle of water. We can attract uh, beneficial insects. We would want to avoid using synthetic fertilizers because that just encourages more new growth, uh, which is something that they favor. We want to do that selective pruning by increasing air circulation. Uh, we want to make sure we're irrigating our pr plants properly because what I have found is oftentimes when plants are getting watered improperly is when we have a tendency to see more of these types of pests. And then um, we're going to, if we need to use a, a pesticide, then we're going to go for the insecticidal soap, which is a very effective way to manage these pests, or we can look at different types of oils, such as horticultural oil or neem oil. Insects with chewing mouth parts. These are going to be insects that are physically chewing the uh, margins of the leaves or, uh, or similar. We're going to remove them by hand or walk around with a little bucket of soapy water and knock them into that bucket. This would be like beetles, weevils, um, um, and then it could expand to 
uh, some other insects, but those are, you know, or even slugs and snails we can remove by hand. We're going to work with barriers and traps because now we can actually prevent them from getting to access those leaves. Uh, we're going to work with beneficial nematodes, which I will share a little bit more about um, in a few minutes. Beneficial nematodes are microscopic worm-like organisms that feed on soil-dwelling insects and the larvae of the insects. And the reason why I bring this up is a lot of times beetles, when they're in their larval stage, uh, they'll be in the soil. And so it's a really great opportunity to actually reduce or break that uh, life cycle by uh, focusing our efforts on reducing the larva of that pest so they can't mature. Uh, working with pesticides would look like working with Bt or Bacillus thuringiensis. This is for, in, uh, you know, like um, leaf rolling caterpillars or any pest caterpillars that might be doing some problem, they can ingest it, it's very effective. Spinosad is a, a pesticide that also needs to be ingested. It is going to be very effective for insects with chewing mouth parts, but also for those thrips and spider mites. It does cover that area as well. And then baits uh, specifically with iron phosphate as the active would be excellent for slugs and snails. Um, and then crawling insects. Uh, you see some of these categories kind of do overlap, but crawling insects, we're going to remove them by hand. This would be, you know, like slugs and snails. Uh, or uh, um, really pulleys, earwigs, and so forth, we can create barriers. We can work with barriers to prevent them. We can work with traps to prevent them. And we can also uh, create barriers with diatomaceous earth or uh, dust, use that dust in the areas that they are, that we see these pests uh, to reduce those populations as well. And we want to understand the mode of action of the pesticides that we use. And this is the uh, part that I find that so many of us are unaware of. First of all, when we use a product, we always want to read the label and make sure that pest is on the label. If that pest isn't on the label, that product's not going to work for that pest problem. Insecticidal soap is going to be most likely in almost all cases my go-to if I need to use a pesticide for many of my outdoor pest problems. It is potassium salts of fatty acids. It is a contact kill, so it needs to make contact with that pest to kill it. It is very narrow spectrum. And what I mean by that, it's going to only manage a very uh, short list of pest problems. It is used to kill soft-bodied insects. So excellent for aphids, white fly nymphs, and so forth. However, what I wanna share is if we have any ladybug larvae on the plant, ladybug larvae is soft bodied. So it could also impact the ladybug larvae. Ladybug beetles have a hard shell, so it's not gonna impact them. So we really wanna inspect the area and make sure we're only targeting what we wanna target. And understand that insecticidal soap is not dish detergent, okay? Dish detergent is something that is not soaked. Neem oil. Neem oil is clarified hydrophobic extracts of neem oil. So it's actually the extracts of uh, the azadiractin tree. Um, it gets a little complicated, but I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, it is a contact kill. It's going to kill what's on, what it makes contact with. Uh, it is very broad spectrum. So it's going to manage a very long list of pest problems. That's going to include insects fungal diseases, and mites, okay? So it's kind of considered a three-in-one because it's an insecticide, a fungicide, and a miticide. Spinosad. It's a bacterium which disrupts the insect's neurotransmission. It needs to be ingested. It is very broad spectrum, although it will not kill insects um, with sucking mouth parts. So it's not, you're not gonna see aphids on the label. You're not gonna see white fly nymphs on the label. It is going to kill insects with those chewing and rasping mouth parts. And this is the big part here. It's limited to six applications in a year. And it says that on the label. Okay. And this is to reduce pesticide resistance. So I'm going to take a minute to talk about how we read a label because reading labels is not an easy task. Uh, we always want to understand how, what is the mode of action of the active ingredient? What is the active ingredient in this product and how does it work? Uh, you can look up this information. My favorite resource is the National Pesticide Information Center. We're also going to see these signal warnings. So uh, caution is going to be slightly toxic 
a warning is going to be monitor, moderately toxic, and then danger is going to be highly toxic or a corrosive product. On the back, or those little booklets that open up, there's also going to be more information. Uh, this particular uh, herbicide is going to give us some information that this is a contact kill. It's non-select, that means it's gonna kill anything it comes in contact with, and it's very broad spectrum. It's a uh, foliar applied, so it's spray applied, grass and weed killer. So these are already terms I've mentioned, okay? Um, the next, thing I'd like to point out is that it's going to have some more information that it's going to kill many types of weeds and grasses. And it is an alternate solution to synthetic grass and weed killers. Okay, it does not translocate, it does not move through uh, the parts of the plant or the soil. It is rainproof when dry. So we always want to understand that we are going to apply pesticides uh, when there is no rain in the forecast of 48 hours. We wanna make sure that those pesticides have dried on the plant and have had some time to work before the rain. And this is also people and pet safe when used as directed. So as you saw in the previous slide, it was uh, registered for organic use, but we want to use it uh, safely. It is gonna be safe for our um, environment and for our people and pets when we use it as directed. And then, as I shared, uh, let's just say the reason why I'm using this herbicide is I want to kill clover. I see that clover is on the label, so I can use this product for clover. And then there's always going to be a precautionary statement because this is registered as a pesticide, okay? And then we always want to wear PPE. Now, we don't have to uh, go out and get a Tyvek suit, but we want to make sure we're wearing long pants, uh, you know, closed-toed shoes, uh, long sleeves, non-cotton gloves. We want to cover uh, our eyes and wear a mask because we do not want to inhale the pesticides. Many of the pesticides are going to be eye irritants and some, such as neem oil, is a can give dermal reaction, have a rash to your skin. So just uh, even though these are eco-friendly products we're talking about, we want to make sure we're protecting ourselves. Tips for using pesticides, we want to understand that mode of action. We want to keep in mind that less toxic products could take longer to work. It could take up to four days for um, uh, neem to actually kill the insects that we see. So let's have some patience. Um, timing is important. We want to know that pest life cycle and we want to apply that pesticide during the best time. So is it the best time to manage it when it's in the larval stage, when it's in the adult stage? You know, this is really helpful. We're going to spot treat and only target that pest. We're going to apply pesticides at dusk when, um, because most of the pollinators and beneficial insects are not going to be active. And, um, you know, many of the pollinators are in their nests and when we apply at sundown, it has the entire evening to dry on the plant. And so by morning, when um, people and pets and pollinators might be active around these plants, uh, there will be no threat. There'll be no residuals that will um, be threatening to our pets, our families, our pollinators, because once those uh, pesticides are dried, uh, there will not be any harmful residuals that can impact them. And if we're releasing beneficial insects, we want to give them some time to find those pests and to uh, bring those populations of the pests down before applying a pesticide. And we also want to understand the unintended consequences. Emily. Hey, Suzanne. Um, I, sorry to interrupt you. Wonder no. if you can turn on the closed captioning. What? There, oh. I think there's a button down on your bottom bar as the host. And I can turn it on? Yes. Okay, is that good? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. great. Thank you so much. I've never used this uh, feature. Great. Okay, thank you, Emily. Um, and then just a couple more things to share before we dive into the pests. Uh, no pesticide is risk-free, unintended consequences of the pesticides. Um, should be understood um, regardless. There's always going to be some type of unintended consequence, regardless if it's eco-friendly or synthetic. And we specifically want to uh, understand when we're using um, the 
DIY pesticides, the consequences also exist. Drift, so we apply when there is no breeze um, so that we're not getting the pesticide on unintended plant material. Also, when we're applying um, products, we want to apply them in accordance with the label so that we avoid contaminating the soil or the groundwater, um, and um, which would then prevent damaging any soil microbes. And understanding more is not better. So some of the things to keep in mind when we're making our own pesticides, um, something I do not recommend, but that uh, dish soap is not, uh, or I should say dish detergent is not soap, okay? Um, the only soap that's on the market is Castile soap, which is under the brand name of Dr. Bronner's. I also know Whole Foods has the 365 um, brand, but please, uh, in, I give you an invitation, get curious and look at the active ingredients on your dish soap and see if these are products that we want to use. Some of them um, do actually cause acute water toxicity. And then salt, salt is very damaging to the soil, uh, the worms and other soil organisms. So I do not advise using salt in the garden. And then vinegar, vinegar must be used with extreme caution. Horticultural vinegar is uh, what is strong enough to kill weeds. Anything that is um, less, um, you know, our household vinegar that we're using in a salad dressing is just 5% acidic acid. That's not going to be strong enough to kill um, our weeds. Um, but horticultural vinegar, which is 20 to 30% acidic acid, is actually strong enough to cause blindness and is corrosive to metals. So that is why I really highly recommend using a lot of caution. And if we have products that we no longer want, that we have lying around the garage or the shed, we could take them to our local household hazardous waste. It's free and it's easy. All right, so now I'm going to look at applying IPM techniques for a lot of our common pest problems. So the first step in pest management is identifying the pest. If we can't identify the pest, it's going to be really hard to manage the problem. Because sometimes we see a pest and it's actually a beneficial insect. Uh, it's not really the pest at all. It's just getting blamed for the damage. So once we've identified it, we're gonna understand the life cycle of that pest and then look at that pest habitat and timing. Sometimes we learn that the pest is really just gonna hang around for about a week or two and it will um, go away on its own, such as uh, every spring we see spittle bugs and it looks like someone spit on your plants, but really they're just around for about uh, a week or two. We are going to then take a closer look and see if any beneficial insects are present. And then if they are, we don't need to take any action. So uh, I have it's a great photo uh, I'd like to share. First, we see this little worm-like organism on our rows. We might freak out. We might ask though, is it a pest or a pal? It's actually a surfed fly larvae that love to prey on aphids. So I specifically plant sweet alyssum around the base of my roses because the surfed fly adult loves sweet alyssum. And when they see aphids on my rose, then they know, oh, I've got enough food available. So I'm going to plant, I'm going to lay some eggs in that area. And once those eggs hatch, the larvae is going to prey on those aphids. And then a lot of times there are lookalikes in the garden. So this is a mealy bug destroyer that feeds on mealy bugs. And this is a flea beetle that feeds on foliage of seedlings and other leafy greens. This is a good bug, this is a bad bug. Very easy to mistake the two. And then another example is that we see these puckered um, kind of red leaves on our fruit trees in the spring. What do we do? Well, this is aphids and this is peach leaf coral. So something I can share is that these are two very different pests. One we would use an insecticide to manage such as the insecticidal soap. The other is a fungal problem that we would manage the peach leaf coral. So um, identifying the plant can also help us identify the pest. This is another cool picture that someone sent me um, asking me what are all what's going on with my plum tree there's all these little you know um, um, I don't know little nodulars on there well this one picture is a ladybug larvae 
And the other is going to, or I should say the ladybug pupa, it's transitioning to be a ladybug or lady beetle. And this is soft scales. So the ladybugs are there, um, the larvae and the adult beetles are there feeding on the soft scale. So we're gonna look at these pests. And the first is gonna be ants. And I myself have already had an ant infestation in my home. So um, kind of timely, but outside we can, I can share that ants are decomposers. They do aerate the soil and they do eat many insect pests, but they also like to farm the honeydew secretions that aphids and other insects make. So they will actually protect the aphids and will try to avoid beneficial insects coming to feed on those aphids. Outdoors, we're going to manage aphid scale and other pests that make these um, sugary secretions. We can do that by um, uh, using uh, making a barrier to prevent ants from farming those honeydew secretions. We can also, uh, you know, make sure the health of the plant is in order that we're irrigating properly and we're feeding it properly and all of that. And then if we need to use a pesticide, we can use an ant bait station that contains the spinosad. When spinosad is in the form of a bait, uh, we do not have a limit to six times a year because um, that only applies to it as a liquid. And there's also baits that have um, the boric acid. Indoors, we're going to kill those scouts, clean up any scent trails. We're going to clean up and remove any food and water sources. We're going to seal cracks and crevices with um, a fresh bead of caulk or similar. We're going to use that weather stripping and so forth. But then we're going to always um, go for that bait station. Bait stations are going to be more effective to use than a spray because the ants can take the bait back to the colony, feed everyone. And then um, that colony has been um, managed. When we use a spray, understand it's just a contact kill and it's only going to kill those ants that are present. Um, the bait stations could take a couple of days to work. The ants will swarm them, especially the taro liquid ant baits because it's a sugar bait with the boric acid as the active. Uh, they're very effective. We just need to be a little patient. And then um, boric acid and diatomaceous earth. I just wanna review these two products. Boric acid, when it comes as a powder, unlike the bait in that liquid form, it is about the size of a grain of salt. And it is excellent for insects that are crawling, such as cockroaches and ants. They walk over it. They are grooming insects. So that's how they're able to ingest the boric acid. And this will um, actually um, disrupt their stomach bacteria that um, is very effective for managing those types of insects. Um, Diatomaceous earth, on the other hand, is a very fine chalk-like dust, and it gets on the exoskeleton of crawling insects, and it dehydrates them. So this is excellent for ants and cockroaches, but then it expands to fleas, flea larvae, silverfish, earwigs, um, and slugs and snails. Okay, slugs and snails and earwigs. Their damage um, looks very similar. It is hard to identify. Uh, and it is, can be quite problematic. I can share with slugs and snails, you will oftentimes see that kind of silvery path that they make. But we're going to uh, reduce their hiding places. We want to uh, maybe switch out plants that they favor with plants that they are not as attractive to. So plants like hostas and agapantha, slugs and snails seem to really love, even daylilies. Maybe consider switching them out with plants they are not going to be as attractive to. We're going to water in the early time of the day, not late in the evening because um, they really do thrive in cool, moist overnight conditions. We're going to hand pick them off, feed them to the chickens or get them out. Uh, somehow, uh, but we want to wear gloves when we're hand picking off slugs and snails. We can use that snail board that I shared earlier. We can use uh, make barriers with copper tape to prevent them from eating the seedlings. Um, and then also applying a chunky wood mulch around the area. Slugs and snails have a difficult time crossing that chunky wood mulch. So that makes it's a really great tool to use. And then if we need to use a pesticide, we can use um, baits. 
uh, that uh, iron phosphate as the active ingredient. These are very effective. Um, they ingest it. It takes a couple hours for that iron phosphate to bind their guts. And typically they're in the shade um, uh, or in, you know, hiding. So we don't get to, see, we don't see a bunch of dead slugs and snails around. Earwigs. We're going to reduce that evening moisture watering early in the morning, similar to slugs and snails. And we're going to use earwig traps. Earwig traps are very effective. Uh, but we also can create barriers with that diatomaceous earth. Um, and then we can use baits that contain our iron phosphate with spinosad, which would be the Sluggo Plus or the um, Bonides Bug and Slug Killer. Rodents in the garden, we're going to remove those places of harborage. We're going to contain our compost. We're going to contain those chicken coops and uh, prevent them from being able to access that food. We're going to keep those lids securely on the garbage cans. We're going to uh, remove pet food availability. So if you're the type of person that just leaves pet food out all day or all night, we want to avoid that because that's actually attracting the rodents. We want to rethink bird feeders and maybe consider having them up just seasonally or during a shorter period of time. Um, but understand that seed is actually falling on the ground and attracting the rodents. Um, we just want to see what, where are they, what food are they accessing? And we want to um, remove their access to that food. Okay. The best way to do that is to secure uh, our, our, you know, dog food into a galvanized garbage can with a secure lid or create exclusion baskets around the garden to prevent them from eating our food. In the house, uh, we're going to uh, place food in metal containers that close, uh, that cl close tight to prevent rodents from accessing it, such as that pet food. We're going to, in the garage or in the attic, we're going to store items in plastic bins rather than cardboard boxes because mice easily can chew through the cardboard and like to nest in those cardboard boxes. Um, some mechanical controls would be uh, replacing that weather stripping um, because that is also going to prevent the rodents. We're going to you know, seal up those foundation vents um, and attic vents with, or I should say, instead of sealing, we're going to replace with half inch hardware cloth. We're going to also check the fireplace vents and stove vents and laundry vents and do the same thing if we see that's how they're coming in. You know, we're going to put that quarter inch hardware cloth over that um, that opening. Um, sheet metal roof flashing um, is going to be excellent also for sealing the gaps around pipes that might be coming. Um, you know, oftentimes like the hose bib or the hot water heater pipe that's leaving the house, they can chew in there. That's a really great point of entry and we can actually cut that sheet metal roof flashing to fit around the pipe and to secure that area. If we're using hardware cloth, we can actually fill in that screen with expanding foam or similar to seal the gaps. Um, and then we wanna look at caulking under sinks and patching any holes in the walls with re repair patch kits to prevent their points of entry. Rats will not chew through quarter inch hardware cloth or sheet metal roof flashing, but they'll chew through just about anything else. So that's why it's so important to focus on these materials. They're also really inexpensive. And some examples of how we use these materials. So the top is a picture of a garage door and see that little gap. Well, they're able just to walk through that with ease. But uh, when we have that, um, that sheet metal corner down in, in the picture, that is going to uh, block that point of entry, preventing them from walking through. And then of course, having that quarter inch hardware cloth behind the vents. Gophers and moles. I'm not sure about you, but I have just had an excessive gopher season. Uh, I have um, I've had a lot of success managing them, but you know, it was very active. Gophers, um, well, we want to proper identify the difference between moles and gophers get confused all the time. Gulf, gophers are herbivores. They're eating the plant parts. They're eating primarily the roots of our plants, but then I'll also come up above ground in the leaves. Their tunnels are pretty deep, about six inches to 12 inches before this, below the surface of the soil. And they do have very extensive burrowing systems. The mounds are actually crescent shaped, and I have a photo I'll show you next. Moles, they eat a lot of bugs. They eat earthworms, white grubs, beetles, uh, larvae, and any other soil dwelling uh, insects. 
their tunnels are very shallow. They're going to be burrowing um, and digging tunnels just about four inches below the surface of the soil. And that's why we actually see oftentimes we'll actually see their tunnels. Um, and they also have very elaborate burrowing systems. So here's picture um, that crescent shaped gopher mounds. It's because of the way they're pushing the soil out. They make a fan, whereas moles come straight up and that's why it looks more like a volcano from the profile, a perfect mole mound. And the way we manage gophers is prevention. We're always going to use a physical barrier. It's the most effective way to manage gophers. Uh, that's planting all of our plants in um, gopher baskets or lining those raised beds with half inch hardware cloth. Um, and then we can also work with repellents. Um, anything that has the active ingredient as castor oil is going to be very effective. However, we always want to follow the directions because the directions are um, very specific and understand that repellents are just temporary deterrents. It's not really solving the problem. And there's a lot of different types of traps on the market. I actually have um, all of these traps. Uh, traps are going to be the most effective way to eliminate the gophers. However, we not all of us feel comfortable with that strategy. So that's why it's so important to really be very proactive with preventing them from accessing the, the food crops and being very diligent with those repellents. Moles, we're going to remove the food source and that is going to be with the beneficial nematodes. So we're gonna remove those grubs. We're gonna remove those soil uh, dwelling larvae because uh, when we don't have that food there, they won't be there. We're going to also use those castor oil repellents as, but again, they're temporary deterrents. Um, and again, there are traps, but I will share, um, traps are very challenging to use for moles. Moles are not as um, easily to trap. So uh, we always focus on the other two. Now, someone sent me an email asking me about this specific question. And so I'd like to say, does this look familiar? It is going to be the cute little raccoons that we love seeing around our gardens. However, they are really quite a pest and I would encourage um, you <laughs> to not invite them to our garden. And how do we do that? Is that we, um, they're looking for the grubs. They are looking for those grubs, just like the moles and go for, I'm sorry, raccoons are very good at rolling that turf. So we, can reduce grubs um, by and eliminate the grubs by keeping the turf area really healthy. We're going to exclude when possible. And in this case, we could put down that uh, poultry wire as a barrier on top of the turf. We can also roll out bird netting and secure it with landscape pins or similar, and that will prevent them from rolling up that turf. But really we want to avoid feeding the wildlife. We don't wanna have that um, food out for our pets because the raccoons also take advantage of it because ultimately we wanna train the raccoons because they're so smart that there is no reward there are no grubs in my garden, so do not come here anymore. And beneficial nematodes, I've mentioned them a, multi, a few times. As I shared, they're microscopic worm-like organisms that feed on soil-dwelling larvae. And check this out. This is so cool. This is actually beneficial nematodes attacking a fungus gnat larvae. So we know how tiny a fungus gnat is. You can imagine how tiny a fungus gnat larvae is. And so that means the uh, beneficial nematodes are even tinier very effective. And then cats and squirrels, we're going to cover that soil or those planting beds with that poultry wire or cat scat mats. These are something you actually can purchase, um, but poultry wire works just as well. This is also going to be very effective to prevent squirrels from digging in the soil. We can also cover areas with bird netting, or we can use those exclusion baskets to prevent them from getting into areas that we don't want them to be. And there are many repellents on the market that are, again, going to be effective, but temporary deterrents. So cat scram is really great for cats. Critter Ritter is going to be really great for raccoons and squirrels. But again, uh, very temporary. We will have to reapply them in accordance to the label. And ultimately, when it comes to feral cats and wild animals, we really want to avoid feeding them. We don't want to contribute to the problem. And then a couple things about dormant sprays. 
Dormant sprays are what we are, um, we are using horticultural oils to uh, suffocate any insects that are overwintering on our fruit trees or our roses. And then we're going to use a copper fungicide that can kill any diseases that might be overwintering on our fruit trees and our roses. And when I say fruit trees, these are deciduous fruit trees like apples and peaches and plums, not citrus. Uh, these are very effective at preventing um, uh, the first aphid population outbreak uh, or other fungal spores that might be overwintering on our plants. Um, we will apply these and according to the label, it's an excellent way to, uh, the winter is an excellent time to apply these pesticides because beneficial insects are typically not active. And we're using less pesticide, so less product, and we're getting the most bang for our buck. So it is a very um, wonderful way to prevent some early spring pests, uh, but we wanna make sure we're applying them during the dormant season, which is now. And when those buds start to swell and there is a crack of petal color, then that means that plant is not is broken dormant season. That dormant season is over for that plant. We will not apply this, um, these products at a dormant mixing rate. So some online resources I'd like to share is the Our Water Our World website, um, the UCIPM website, bugguide.net will help with um, bug identification or insect identification. And then the National Pesticide Information Center, which will help with our active ingredients. Learn more about the mode of action and those unintended consequences that pesticides may have. You can find our recorded webinars on the Fairfield Sassoon Sewer District website under public outreach. And yes, thank you for joining us. I know that was fast and furious, but like I said, I had a lot of information and I really wanted to keep it at an hour. So right. much. So great. Um, Suzanne, do you have time? We have three questions. Yes. Yes, I have time. I just thank you for everyone that's still on. And I know you have to go. Thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit more about dealing with mealybugs? Oh, yeah. Mealybugs are very challenging um, because they're very good at hiding. They will hide in the soil. They will hide under the lip of the pot. They will hide underneath the pot in the, around the saucer. So when we have mealybugs, we want to um, be uh, very serious and um, with our action. Um, insecticidal soap will work very well. However, we, the, on the label, it says to apply every five to seven days. We are going to make sure we're applying every five to seven days. And I would really make sure I'm applying that five day interval because we want to kill any eggs that have hatched. Okay. And we want to make sure we are getting in those nooks and crannies. Horticultural oils and neem oils can also work, but some oils, some plants are, um, the oil would be phytotoxic. So in that case, we want to maybe do a little test on a part of the plant to see if it would work. But again, um, we want to follow that label's instructions and make sure that we're applying it. Um, in accordance to the label. Um, but first we wanna take a closer look and really make sure we do not have any mealybug destroyer larvae. The mealybug destroyer, which is a lady beetle, the larvae looks just like a mealybug, but it's a little larger. It's like a supersized, I'm sorry, it looks just like the mealybug. Did I say that? I think I did. Um, but it's like a supersized mealybug and it moves really fast. So if we see the mealybug destroyer feeding on the mealybugs, because that's their favorite thing to do, and they're eating them at a very rapid rate at about one per minute, we want to just be patient, maybe isolate that plant and make sure the mealybug um, destroyer can do its job. Um, however, uh, if we do not see mealybug destroyer larvae, we can take that plant out. We're gonna to wanna to, um, change out the soil. We wanna sterilize the pot, sterilize the saucer, make sure any plants in the area also don't have mealybugs. Wow, okay, great, and thank it's you. It's kind of a big deal, I'm sorry. Um, I've, thrown, I've thrown plants away that have had mealybugs because I just know how troublesome it is. Yep. Uh, do bird feeders attract raccoons? I'm not sure if bird feeders attract raccoons. Um, they certainly attract rats. 
but um, I'm not, I guess it would be depend what's in the bird feeder. Yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know if like a suet would also attract a raccoon. I could see a suet maybe attracting a raccoon more than just bird seed. Okay. So I'm not sure. Maybe. That's a good question. Yeah. And then um, last question, can you talk a bit more about what type of beneficial nematodes you would use on a lawn to prevent raccoons? Oh, yes. Um, when you go to those resources, um, that was Rincon Vitova or um, really your local garden centers um, would also have this information. You know, Mid City in um, American Canyon is actually a really great resource for beneficial insects. Uh, but there, there's three species of beneficial nematodes. And when you're buying them, there is going to be um, a species specific for the grubs. And um, sometimes when you're buying them, you actually have an opportunity uh, opportunity to buy two species to even cover a more broader selection of uh, pests. So um, they will be, they will list on the container what insects that specific species is going to manage. The target. Great. Thank you. I think that was perfectly answered. And um, just recognizing we're about five minutes after time. And just to reiterate, that this recording and the resources um, will all be shared afterwards um, through with Suzanne. So thank you so much to Suzanne and to everyone who participated um, and joined us and kind of share our mission and vision to um, keep the water uh, clean in our neighborhoods um, and in our yards. So appreciate that. Yeah, Have a thank you weekend. everyone. Yeah. Thank oh. you. We'll be back in the spring with two more um, webinars with Suzanne, but this is it for um, 2022 for us. So see you again in 2023. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your great questions and your time. Um, have a great afternoon. Thanks, Emily. Bye, thanks. Have a great weekend. Yeah, you too.